you had to change my appearance, what would you do to me? I could make you look like me. Now using his extraordinary skills to rebuild lives. What does granddad say? He says, which year is it? Which year is it? And he looks at both sides. Tonight, you'll have to see this to believe it. A man who breathes life into silicone and clay and transforms people's lives. Tricks used by spies and in Hollywood. We'll take you to his lab and show you how he works his magic. EC News. This is Primetime Thursday with Diane Sawyer and Charles Gibson. We're going to begin tonight with a man who spent two decades working at the art of deception. A man whose amazing skills put him at the center of international intrigue. He was, quite simply, the CIA's master of disguise. His prosthetic masks allowed agents to change their identities. But when he left the spy agency, he began to use his talents to help ordinary people in extraordinary ways. Before we begin, we should warn you that some of the people you're about to see have been through terrible ordeals and left badly scarred until they met Bob Barron, who has helped them feel alive again. Take a look at some pictures and look at these faces very closely. Notice anything unusual about this man or this woman? Well, each of these people have been in some way disfigured by cancers or accidents or congenital defects and were afraid to go out in public, much less show their faces on television, until they met Bob Barron. In simple terms, you build them new faces? I build them new faces. When I'm driving, I'm da going down with one hand here like this to hold it up here to make it. Because Margaret Bowden lost her left eye to cancer. She's missing everything. She's missing the ocular and the orbit. She came to me. I told her that I would take an impression of the defective area and sculpt the mirror image and make her the prosthetic device that would fit right into the void. That fits real nice. Now, how easy is it for her to take that in and out? Does she keep it on all the time? No, she just wears it when she goes out to the grocery store or out in public. And she can put it in or take it out in just a few seconds. Do people give you a second glance when, when you have your prosthesis in, or do they? No, do they, they don't even know it. They don't know it. That's just about got it, right? You know. Right, it's perfect. I mean, people wear patches over their eyes. People put bandages over their eyes. And that's just not good enough. Is there any part you can't do? Yeah, everything in the face uh, is possible to do. The nose, you can rebuild it. I can rebuild. Ears. Ears, I can rebuild the ears. Hands. Hands, I can rebuild hands. Stepping into Barron's lab in the basement of his Virginia home, well, it can be a bit unsettling. It's a sort of human parts department, parts of the anatomy. And you can't help when you're there but think of a mad scientist creating ears, noses, fingers. His creations are eerily lifelike even when you see them sitting by themselves. He skillfully builds his prosthetic devices layer by layer out of silicone, building in pores, veins, Artistically, he even paints in skin imperfections. You have to know how to sculpt. You have to know chemicals. You have to know how to take impressions. Baron is a painter by training. This is not a photograph, and this isn't either. These are Bob Baron paintings. He's not a doctor. He never went to medical school. So how did he get into this business of making fingers and eyes and noses? Well, actually, it's a great story. Years ago, just starting out, he worked at the Pentagon as an art director for some Navy magazines. It was a low-level job, and he got a low-level parking pass, far away from the Pentagon building. I forged a parking sticker, and I parked where the admirals and the generals and right there at South Parking, so I wouldn't have to walk 15 minutes through the snow. And, and you got caught. Somebody turned me in, and I said, whoa, I think I'm in trouble. Barron was summoned to court and the judge wanted to know where he got the parking pass. I said, I made it, Your Honor. He said, approach the bench, approach the bench, closer. So I got right up next to him. He said, damn good job. 
Days later, he got a call from the CIA. They were looking for a forger. Barron strongly suspects the judge recommended him. But it began a career with the CIA that would take him all across the globe to all the hot spots in the world, from Moscow to the Far East, the Middle East, Latin America. The agency soon moved him from forgery to disguises, the simple stuff, like mustaches and wigs. Back in the uh, mid-60s... Herb Saunders was Barron's boss. Disguise consisted primarily of uh, a little mole on the face, uh, a pair of window pane sunglasses, perhaps, uh, or clear lenses, uh, a rock in the shoe to make you uh, limp a little bit, and, uh, and an ill-fitting red wig. As the Cold War escalated, there was a need for more sophisticated disguises. The most skilled disguise artists were in Hollywood, working on films like Planet of the Apes. Take your sticking paws off me, you damn dirty ape! It's intriguing, the idea that the CIA learns from Hollywood. Yeah, well, this is an arcane kind of skill. You, you, know, you, you can't really develop it on your own. And, and we wanted to get there as quickly as we could. We didn't have time to fool around. You wanted disguises that would pass very close, very close. three feet away inspection. Very close, very close. So Barron learned many of his techniques from Hollywood. Yes. If you had to change my appearance, what would you do to me? I could make you look like me. You could? Yeah. How? Take an impression of your face and sculpt my face uh, to go over your face. So I could get on an elevator looking like me and reach the bottom floor and I'd look like you. That's right. Have you ever had to do that? Probably. Those CIA guys don't talk much when they leave the agency. But what we have seen Tom Cruise do in the Mission Impossible movies... You keep calling me Dimitri. You really shouldn't. You are not Dimitri. Baron was living for real. Have you ever been in a situation where lives depended on that disguise? Absolutely. Ever been involved in a situation where a disguise was instrumental in a, in a case that changed history? Yes. Have you ever disguised yourself? Yes. And his disguises could have made Baron a lot of money in Hollywood. But instead, he decided to help people like Margaret when he retired from the CIA after 24 years. In the CIA, you were making somebody look like someone else. Right. Here, you're making them look like themselves. Right. Giving them back their identity. A case in point, eight-year-old Brittany Hoyle, who has a congenital defect. She was born without an ear. She has no hearing, no ear canal on the right side. A plastic surgeon could have operated on Brittany, but it would have taken at least four invasive operations, even taking a piece of her rib to sculpt into an ear that would only look reasonably normal. Donna Hoyle didn't want that um, for her daughter. The surgery really seemed a little bit barbaric as far as, you know, actually taking the rib. Brittany's grandfather, a doctor, wanted her to have the surgery. He didn't want his granddaughter wearing a silicone ear. He didn't think that it would look good. I mean, he didn't think it would be natural. But then he saw Baron work his magic. What does granddad say? He says, which ear is he? Which ear is he? And he looks at both sides. Yeah, everyone is awestruck. And what does Brittany see now when she looks at herself? I see two ears when I look in the mirror. And she is one happy little girl the victim of an attempted honor killing, a conservative Islamic practice that allows men, as a matter of pride and honor, to brutalize women. Zahida Praveen was a beautiful woman, living with her husband and children in this poor, tiny Pakistani village, until one day when her husband snapped, went berserk, and went after his pregnant wife. He accused her of having an affair. Dr. Nassim Ashraf works with the Pakistani Human Rights Group. He describes what happened to Zahida that night. He gouged her eyes off, he cut her nose off, cut her ears off. And he did all this in their own home and uh, hung her upside down before he did it. How do you do that? He was a barber by profession. And he had one of those old-fashioned razors. And he did it with that. He left her for dead. He untied her and left her for dead on the floor of the, of the room. But Zahida lived. When her wounds healed, she looked like this. 
You've seen a lot of people disfigured. Had you ever seen anything that bad? No. I was totally unprepared for what I saw physically. She lost her ears. She lost part of her nose. And she lost her eyesight. She was sent to the United States for a team to, to work on her. The team includes Dr. Michael Singer, a dentist who specializes in facial implants. He'll make the titanium devices that will be surgically implanted into Zahida, to which her prosthetics will be attached. Also on the team, Dr. Craig Dufresne, chief of plastic surgery at Fairfax Hospital in Virginia. He admits Zahida's wounds would be tough to fix with plastic surgery alone. I think to try to restore her in the classic plastic surgery sense would require a multitude of operations and probably take two years. When you finished with the two years and multiple operations, where would she be? She would look better, but she wouldn't look perfectly restored. I would still know this was a very disfigured human being. That is true. What can he do for her? Bob can create much finer features. Um, he can create uh, a much better color match, texture match. I think Bob, with his talents in this particular case, I think his job is really the one that's going to make all the difference in the world. Some of the scar tissue is very... Dr. Thin. Singer and Barron join Dr. Dufresne in the operating room. Dufresne is cleaning up Zahida's wounds and implanting Dr. Singer's titanium devices, anchors, you might call them. Yeah, that, sh that should be far enough, don't you think? Barron's new, so Barron's new silicone creations will fit seamlessly onto her face. Instead of two years of plastic surgery, with plastic surgery plus prosthetics, how long will it take? Probably about uh, three to four months. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Hold on. And she will go back in the situation where she can comfortably reintegrate herself into society? I or will so. she still look to me deformed? No, she will not look deformed. She will look, she will look very good, very normal. She does not have any money to pay for any of this, which is why Barron, Singer, and Dufresne donated their time and talent, so that after four months of countless operations and fittings, this woman, who was so horribly disfigured when she arrived in the U.S., would look like this when she returned home. While in Pakistan last summer, Dr. Ashraf went to see Zahida. She now lives with her brothers, who take care of her and her children. And what does she say about her own face now? She, she can't see it, obviously, but she then tells me what others have been telling her about her face. And she says, well, you know, someone came to me and said that I look exactly like I did when I got married. So that must obviously, you know, make her feel very, very happy. Even though there's a little piece of tape temporarily holding her eye in place, the prosthetics make Zahida look the way her children remember her as well. She went to the U.S., had the surgery, and wears the prosthetics so that her children won't be afraid of her scars. And she did it for her little girl, born after the attack, a child she has never seen and never will see. You may be wondering about Zahida's husband, well, he was caught, tried, and convicted, and sentenced to 14 years in prison. And perhaps the most telling example of how profoundly Bob Barron can improve someone's life is the case of Jim Alexander and the terrible fire he barely survived. Jim Alexander was perhaps Bob Barron's toughest case. He had battled alcohol in his life, lost his only son in a motorcycle accident, and his marriage had dissolved along the way. But he'd gotten his life together. He'd stopped drinking for good, and still had his job of 30 years at the Indianapolis Power and Light Company in Petersburg, Indiana. But that all changed December 4th, 1996, when Jim decided to stop for a cup of coffee before work. He pulled into Huck's convenience store, and then blacked out. It was not liquor he'd stopped drinking. To this day, no one knows why he blacked out. But the consequences were horrible. They couldn't get the doors open, get you out? No. They estimated uh, flames 15 to 20 feet in the air. And they burned right around you. In other words, you caught on fire. Yes. The fire come in the back, left rear. Of course, it burnt me from the left on over. But my glasses I were wearing, I had the steel rims left where it just melted the plastic off of it. How long did the fire burn before they could put it out? They estimated I was in the car for 20 minutes.
Jim literally cooked in that car. He was medevaced to a burn unit, where they put him into a drug-induced coma. They put me in a coma because they said I wouldn't have been able to stand the pain. You know how many grafts they did? Well, I've had uh, 38 surgeries so far. Where'd they get the skin? All of it on my head, they got off my back. That's actual, actually muscle on my head. My nose is from my thigh, this arm here, it's up here, and then the one here, it's down in here for the blood supply for my nose. They took the vein out of my leg. They've moved every part of you all yes, over the place. Yes, they have. <laughs> The doctors eased off on the drugs and brought Jim out of his coma after three months. It was then he learned what had happened and how he looked. Well, I really didn't want to live. Why, Jim, was it, I don't want to live looking like this? What was it? Mostly looking like this. What made you decide not to kill yourself? The devastation it would bring to my daughters. I think that's where God came into the 38 surgeries that he's brought me through. There's gotta be a reason. Sure. <laughs> you know, there's just no doubt in my mind. Jim also lost most of his eyesight in the accident. He can only see fuzzy colors and shapes out of one eye. Born, his daughters help take care of him. They no, pay his yeah, bills, yeah. buy his groceries, and they also keep him company. <laughs> Some of Jim's buddies from the power plant <laughs> used to take him out to eat well, occasionally. Yeah. Three, right, until yeah. one time, Jim was asked yeah. not to return to the restaurant. He made other diners uncomfortable. So Jim simply went home and stayed there, checking his mail with a magnifier or listening to the History Channel or books on tape. Archibald was deferring to you. So I feel like a, a prisoner in my own home. I stand outside and I can hear the traffic go by and I can hear the power plant over there where I work. And I think back at the people I worked with and. Uh, you just feel like you're stopped and the world's going around you. Jim says God has never let him feel sorry for himself, but he does feel sorry for the folks who have to look at his scars. So when his son-in-law heard of a man who could make him a new face, well, Jim felt his prayers had been answered. Jim, this is not an easy question. Describe to me what you think you look like right now. Like a freak in a sideshow. What do you think you're going to look like? I think I'm going to look close to what I used to look like. And that's what Bob Barron set out to do. Using pictures of Jim from before the accident, he sculpted Jim a full face mask. It's going to look real good. And we were there, along with Jim's daughter and son-in-law, when Bob first put the mask on Jim. Slip this on you. OK. Uh, yeah. This is going to fit. I'll glue it on later. Okay. The transformation happened there. right before our eyes. But that's going to be good. Let's put this on, see how that's going to look. This is going to do. Okay. Okay. That's now we glue all this in place. It, it had to be made so it wouldn't touch his face. Because the skin is too sensitive? Yes. The prosthetic device had to be just thick enough so it wouldn't collapse when he breathed. I can't tell on the jawline no you won't under be. the under the uh, no. mustache where the mask begins and, and jim starts you've got lines on the forehead which are appropriate to a 55 year old man which is nice jim you won't have to age yeah. everything's not perfect jim can't move the mouth of his mask he doesn't have enough muscle in his lips but other than that let me get that right there just bring that out just a little bit just darken just a little bit He's getting up under your eyelids now. Not much. Doesn't take much. Seeing it myself and being in that room, well, the transformation was extraordinary. The eyebrows, the eyelashes. You have to do each individual hair. Right. I take the eye of a needle, and I grind the eye off, and I use that to put the hair into the silicone one by one. I'll turn it over to you. At the final fitting, Barron wanted not only Jim's approval, but that of his daughter and son-in-law as well. What do you, what do you think, Bill? <laughs> you think, right. Kim? It's wonderful. Yeah. Adjust it. And then pull the hair back. And now it's on. And uh, let's try the glasses on just to see how the glasses are going to work. How's that look, Kim? Great. 
There you go. <laughs> you don't get much better than that, does it? No. No, it doesn't get much better than that, uh, no. I don't think. Just as he had done so many times before in the CIA, Barron took Jim for what he calls a trial run to see if the new face would pass public inspection. When we put Jim on that tour bus, I was looking at the people to see if anyone gave him a glance. And they didn't look at him twice. They didn't look at him once. That's convincing. But for Jim, the true test of his mask would be returning home, visiting his old friends at the power plant, the men and women who had supported him and helped pull him through his toughest times. It was not until he'd gotten the mask that he felt comfortable seeing them all again. Hi, Joe, how you doing? My friends and co-workers. Great, buddy. <laughs> Pete. How you doing, Pete? Okay. They took up donations. They had raffles. Hey, Stevie. How you doing, bud? <laughs> you good. Hey, you looking good. Thank you. Thank you. They had a party in my honor, yeah. and they raised over $11,000. Yeah, I tell that to God bless you, buddy. You know, I always wanted to thank this great big million dollar word I could say to him, but I never could thank one. And uh, all I can think is thank you, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. You're a beautiful man, Jim Alexander. <laughs> you are. Jim Alex weeks ago, Jim Alexander underwent another operation. He now has near perfect vision in one eye, which means he was able to see the mask and, for the first time, the faces of two grandchildren born since his accident. Well, as for Bob Barron, he's currently working on a new set of ears for a September 11th victim, a woman severely burned at the Pentagon in the very building Barron once worked. And Barron has offered his services to other 9-11 victims, no charge.